Okay. Um, good afternoon. Um, today is uh, Tuesday. Uh, February 9th, and this is the Vermont House Human Services Committee, and we are um, starting our, our afternoon meeting, uh, having a walkthrough by Legislative Council of H-171, um, a bill related to uh, um, improving quality access um, for, uh, for child care. Katie. Great, hello, Katie McLinn, Office of Legislative Counsel. I'm gonna pull up the document so we're all literally on the same page. How did I do? Are you seeing H-171? All right. Okay, so H-171 is um, an act relating to childcare and changes, um, just to give you kind of a broad overview, there are some changes to the subsidy program, um, Child Care Financial Assistance Program, CCFAP. There are also some programs to support the workforce, the child care workforce. There um, are also a few provisions that create um, either reports or study groups looking at financing and governance of child care in Vermont. So that's what we'll be going through this afternoon. The bill starts with a finding in legislative intent section. Um, for today's purpose to move through the bill, I might just skip that and get right to the substance of the bill. And um, we could go back another time and look at it if the committee would like to. So to start off, this first section deals with the Child Care Financial Assistance Program, CCFAP. And the language we're looking at right here is um, codified law in the green books. Um, and I want to flag for the committee that this section appears in the bill it, it, it is amended in two different places. It is amended twice. The first time it is amended right here in section two, it takes effect on July 1st, 2021. It's later amended in the bill to take effect on July 1st, 2022. So I just wanna flag that even though the same section appears twice, the different amendments to this section take effect a year apart. So first in subdivision A1, um, there's language about um, why the program is established and there's an additional purpose on lines 11 and 12 added to support the healthy development of their children, the family's children. And then you'll notice that there's some language removed. There's language removed that families seeking employment shall be entitled to participate in the program for up to three months and the commissioner may further extend that period. So that, um, limitation that families seeking employment could participate for up to three months that is removed. The next change is in subdivision A2. And this talks about how um, the subsidy is structured. And in current law, the lower limit of the fee scale is up to and including 100% of the current federal poverty guidelines. So this change is to 100, the lower limit is 150% of the current federal poverty lines, um, meaning that a family at or below 150% of the current federal poverty guidelines receives the full benefit um, of the program. So that all takes effect on July 1, 2021. And then we have a word change here um, that this, the scale shall be structured that it supports employment versus encourages employment. Next in section three, um, this language is notwithstanding just in fiscal year 2022, the language that we just looked at with regard to the upper income limit of the fee scale. Um, so I might just scroll up so you can see what existing law says. So right here on lines 19 through 21, the upper income limit of the fee scale shall be neither less than 200% of the current federal poverty guidelines nor more than 100% of the state median income adjusted for family size. So what section three does is just for one year, just for fiscal year 2022, it adjusts the upper income limit of the fee scale to not be less than 350% of the federal poverty level guidelines adjusted for the size of the family. Section four is the same section that we amended in section two. This is where the changes take effect on July 1, 2022. 
The first change is in subdivision A4. This is a technical correction. This is cleanup because this um, change will take effect after September 30th, 2021. Um, and since this language specifies that this change takes effect after September 30th, 2021, we no longer need this language after that date. So we can remove that language. And then here's the substantive change. There's a new subdivision A5. And this language reads that families eligible to participate in CCFAP shall include those in which a parent or guardian works at least part-time, works a non-traditional schedule, is enrolled only part-time in a higher education or job training program, including graduate and professional programs, or a second bachelor's degree program, or is participating in inpatient or intensive outpatient substance misuse treatment or mental health treatment or both. So that's a change that would take effect again, July 1, 2022. The next change um, has to do with how um, the payments are calculated for the CCFAP program. So under the current language, um, there's sort of split in between two pages here. There's language about using the prevailing market rate for comparable services. So the proposed change is that the payment established under the section shall reflect the following considerations. Whether the provider operates a licensed childcare facility or re regulated childcare home is struck. That's sort of a technical change. Um, it's being replaced with regulated childcare program. Um, licensed childcare facilities and registered family childcare homes are regulated childcare programs. So it's kind of just using a shortened term there to capture those two other categories. Um, whether the, so whether the provider operates a regular, regulated childcare program, the type of service provided and the cost of providing the service, including early childhood educator compensation that is commiserate, commiserate with peers and other fields. So taking into account that child um, educator compensation piece is new. And then payment shall be based on enrollment and the proposed change um, removes um, language about any other basis agreed to by the provider in the division. So um, if this change were to take effect, payments would only base, be based on enrollment and some of the flexibility that the division now has would um, not be available any longer. Next is section six. This is, um, I sort of like to think of it as a set of instructions that the General Assembly is giving the Child Development Division when they're negotiating with the federal government about how the um, subsidy program should be structured. So you're asking the Deputy Commissioner of the Child Development Division to seek out an amendment to the division's Federal Child Care Development State Plan. And these are the different components that, we'll, that we're asking to amend. So first, adjusting the sliding scale of CCFAP to ensure that families whose gross income is up to including 150% of the federal poverty guidelines receive 100% of the available benefit. So this, um, asking for this change um, just matches what has been done in section two of the bill. In section two of the bill, um, the language was changed to increase the limit from 100% to 150%. So this is kind of the parallel um, construction of that asking um, that the federal government, um, when we are negotiating the child care and, um, sorry, the federal child care and development state plan, um, that we would like to make this change to 150%. The second change is to adjust the sliding scale of CCFAP to calculate family contributions based on a percentage of the family's annual income. Um, this and three, which is changing the methodology used to inform the fee scale and its child care financial assistance program from the market rate survey to the cost of care um, is part of um, reflecting some of the changes um, that the department is proposing as part of the five-year plan. 
So those are changes that we're directing um, the child care division to seek from the federal government. And then the last piece of this child care financial assistance program is in section seven. So this is the appropriation for everything that we've talked about so far. Um, so this is the fiscal year um, 2022 appropriation. And um, the ask is for roughly 4.7 million to be appropriated from the general fund to the child development division above the fiscal year 21 base appropriation for the purpose of implementing the changes in section two and three. That's increasing um, the lower limit on an ongoing basis and uh, adjusting the upper limit for fiscal year 2022 only. And then in subsection B, we have intent language. And we have, um, we have this intent language because we're trying to avoid getting in the situation where we're binding the hands of a future um, legislative body by making an appropriation um, so far out. So it, it's the intent um, but it's not binding that an appropriation that meets or exceeds the amount distributed in fiscal year 2022 be made in fiscal years 2023 through 2026 to progressively adjust the upper income limit of CCFAP each year. And the second piece of that is that by fiscal year 2026, a family shall not spend more than 10% of their gross annual income on childcare. So those are all the child care subsidy pieces. Okay, I'm gonna move on to uh, technology. So section eight is also an appropriation. This is a fiscal year 2022 appropriation. 4.7 million is appropriated from the general fund to CDD for the purpose of completing implementation of the Bright Futures Information System Modernization Plan. So that is completion of that work that was started, um, I don't know if it was last year or two years ago, but um, that's the appropriation to finish that process. And then on top of page 10, we move into workforce supports. So let me tell you what you're going to see before we look at it. Um, we're adding a new subchapter to the existing chapter on child care. Um, that deals specifically with workforce. And this chapter is going to create um, three different programs. There's going to be um, a scholarship program for current providers, scholarships for um, prospective providers, and there's also gonna be a loan forgiveness portion. Um, and you'll see that these programs, um, I believe except for the first one, they're all time limited. And so after we go through each of these programs, you'll see there is repeal language that at a date certain, these programs go away. So first is the scholarships for current and early childhood providers. Um, and subsection A, we're just setting it up that it's a need-based scholarship program for individuals employed by a regulated, privately operated center-based program or a family childcare home while acquiring credits in early childhood development or that are related directly to working with children from birth through age eight. Subsection B directs that the division is to contract for the administration of the program, adopt policies, procedures, and guidelines necessary for its implementation. And it um, tells us that scholarships are distributed on a first come first serve basis until the funds are depleted. And then subsection C um, only allows um, somebody to participate in one program at a time. So an individual can't um, participate in this program and also be receiving the loan uh, repayment assistance um, from the program that we're gonna look at in section 3543. The next program is the scholarships for prospective providers. And again, in subdivision A1, we're just setting this up that it is for individuals pursuing a college or graduate degree in early childhood education or early childhood special education. Uh, the program um, is to provide financial assistance up to the full cost of tuition for an eligible individual. And then we go on to define what, who is eligible for this program. So it's somebody 
um, who attends a Vermont college or university at least part-time. Um, they have to be pursuing an associate's, bachelor's, or master's degree in early childhood education or early childhood special education. And the person has to commit to working in early childhood education for at least three years after completion of their degree program. And again, the department is to adopt policies, procedures, and guidelines necessary for implementing the program. Scholarship, excuse me, scholarships are distributed on a first come first serve basis until the funds are depleted. And again, in subsection C, we have this language that limits um, somebody to participating in only one program at a time. So a person who's taking advantage of this program can not also be participating in the um, loan repayment assistance program. The last of these three programs is the student loan repayment assistance program. There um, sub, in subdivision A1, we're setting up the program. This is for the purpose of providing student loan repayment to an individual employed by a regulated, privately operated center-based childcare program or home. And then um, we go on to list who is eligible. Somebody um, who is working in a privately operated center-based childcare program as a lead or associate teacher or in a family childcare home that is regulated by the division for at least an average of 30 hours a week for 48 weeks of the year. They have to receive an annual salary of not more than $60,000 and they have to have earned a bachelor's or master's degree in early childhood education or early childhood special education within the preceding five years. And then to participate in the program, the individual has to submit to um, DCF documentation expressing the individual's intent to work in a regulated privately operated center-based program or a family child care home for at least the next 12 months. A participant may receive up to $4,500 annually in repayment assistance, which is to be distributed by the department in four allotments. And the department shall distribute at least one quarter of the individual's total annual benefit after the individual has completed three months of employment in accordance with the program. The remainder of the individual's total annual benefit is distributed by the department every three months thereafter. Again, this authorizes or directs the department to adopt policies, procedures, and guidelines necessary to implement the provisions of the section. Um, the funds are appropriated, shall be expended for repayment of student loans. And this, again, is available on a first come, first serve basis until the funds are depleted. Again, we have this language in subdivision three that um, says if you're participating in this program, you can't also be participating and the previous one of the previous two programs, um, the scholarships for current or prospective um, providers. So those are the three programs, and then we have some language um, about funding them. So basically, A1, 2, and 3 tracks the order of the programs that we just went through in the previous section. So these are all appropriations for fiscal year 22. 300000 is appropriated for the um, current provider scholarship program, 200,000 for the prospective early childhood provider scholarship program. And in subdivision A3, we have 200,000. Oh, I'm sorry. I have been saying this wrong. No, I was right. 300,000, 200,000. And then we have 2 million in um, loan repayment assistance. That was the last program we looked at. And then in subsection B, we again have this intent language so as not to bind a future legislature to a certain appropriation, but it's the intent of the General Assembly that appropriations that meet or exceed the amounts appropriated in fiscal year um, 2022 um, should be made in fiscal years 2023 through 2026. So again, that's getting at the time limited nature of the programs that we just looked at. And then we get right into the repeals. So the first program, the student loan repayment assistance program um, is repealed. Um, is that right? Yes. Um, we're only repealing subsection C of that program. Subsection C is the section that refers to the other two programs. So let me say that another way. The program that um, deals with current scholarships for current early childhood providers 
is an ongoing program that won't be repealed. What will be repealed is subsection C that references the other two programs because the other two programs are going away. So in subsection B here and subsection C, you'll see that the perspective um, scholarship program goes away on July 1, 2026, and the stu student loan repayment assistance program is repealed on July 1, 2026. So those are the workforce supports. And then we move into a series of um, study groups and reports on um, various aspects of the childcare system. So first we have a governance study. In subsection A, it gives the purpose in order to ensure that Vermont's governance for early uh, childhood education effectively meets the needs for children, families, and providers Bright Futures is to undertake an analysis that evaluates and makes recommendations of the following. So here are all the things um, that are going to be part of the analysis. Existing early childhood education governance and administrative stakeholders and structures. Early childhood education governance and administrative functions that are currently not staffed or understaffed. Emerging system needs, stakeholder engagement and decision-making processes and state plan development. In subdivision five, line eight, mechanisms to strengthen system oversight and leverage current system strengths, identification of existing needs and challenges, and lastly, ensuring that an anti-racist approach is used in modifying existing policies and procedures and creating new policies and procedures. So this analysis and recommendations are to be submitted by January 15 of 2022 by Building Bright Futures. Subsection C um, instructs that Building Bright Futures is to consult the Early Care and Education Advisory Committee that is established in um, one of the coming sections that we'll look at and preparing the analysis. And in subdivision D1, we have an appropriation for fiscal year 2022. $150,000 is appropriated from the general fund to Building Bright Futures to implement this section to do this work. And in subdivision two, Building Bright Futures may use appropriated funds to cover administrative needs associated with the study and to um, contract a consultant with experience in organizational or administrative governance, administration, or system management experience. And then we have a definition of early care and education. Um, it means programming provided at center-based uh, programs or family child care homes regulated by um, the Department for Children and Families and Child Development Division that serves children from birth to um, five years of age. We have this definition. Um, we're no longer operating in um, the green books. This would be in session law. Um, but in general, the language is starting to um, move towards early care and education. Um, and those types of terms are not... Um, currently reflected in the Green Book. So I wanted to make sure since these are the terms that um, are being used in the various studies um, and work groups that we're gonna be looking at that we're defining what that term means and um, kind of tying it back into the terms that we're familiar with from the Green Books. In section 13, this is a financing study. On January 15th of 2022, the state treasurer, auditor, JFO, commissioner of finance, and commissioner of taxes is to deliver the General Assembly a comprehensive report identifying and determining the feasibility of implementing a stable long-term funding source to finance affordable, high-quality early childhood care system given child care's role in post-pandemic stimulus and long-term economic development. So this group of individuals is to consider stable ongoing funding necessary to achieve um, a system in which a family does not spend more than 10% of its gross annual income on childcare, in which childcare providers receive compensation on par with their peers and other fields, in which Vermont children below five years of age have access to a childcare space that meets their needs, and in which early care and education programs are able to support families' access to coordinating services. And the report required is to determine 
a stable long-term funding source to fund the system, the optimum design of a stable long-term funding source, the feasibility of such a stable long-term funding source in terms of sustainability, equity, and appropriateness, and the feasibility of dedicating revenue from a stable long-term funding source to a dedicated early care and education fund, create, basically creation of a special fund, and the most efficient methods of administering and distribution of this special fund. In subsection C, this group of individuals we've identified at the beginning of this section is to include input from state or contracted economists and analysts or both including an economist or analyst with expertise that's specifically related to early care and education issues. And as part of this report required under this section, the same group of individuals and any contracted advisors are to produce a consensus evaluation of the economic impact of investment in high quality affordable childcare um, for children birth through age five years of age um, through a uh, a long-term stable funding source. So the consensus evaluation is to include both microeconomic and macroeconomic simulations, looking at individual and economy-wide impacts and responses, and the allocation of such impacts across economic sectors, including direct, indirect, and induced results. Subdivision two goes into the data tools to be used to do this um, consensus evaluation. Um, it shall include Moody's Analytics and customized, customized Moody's Online Vermont models, as well as dynamic and other input and output-based models, including those regional economic models, uh, regional dynamics, Im, Implan, IM, PLAN, and other models as advised. The consensus evaluation is to consider demographic impacts, workforce impacts, warnings, savings, and multiplier effects for parents and guardian or guardians, child care providers, early care and education programs, entities providing supplies and services for early care and education programs, children receiving child care as future members of the workforce, general business earnings and multipliers stemming from increased workforce participation, community development, increased tax revenue, and social service savings, including healthcare, education, and corrections. And the consensus evaluation shall present findings on the following. First, the efficacy of the infrastructure investment in high quality affordable early care and education as a short-term stimulus to enhance Vermont's economic well-being in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic. And secondly, the efficacy of the infrastructure investment in high quality affordable early care and education as a long-term economic development tool and to the extent possible to quantify long-term return on investments. In subsection E, the Secretary of Administration um, shall be allowed to accept philanthropic contributions to underwrite the cost of hiring economists and analysts to do this work. And then the end of this section is the same definition we've already seen in the previous section, the definition of early care and education. The next section creates an advisory committee, Early Care and Education Governance and Administration. Um, so first, we're just kind of setting up the purpose. Um, we're creating an advisory committee to advise um, this uh, child development division on all services pertaining to children and early education regulation, including um, licensing rules, policies and procedures, administration of the early child care education system, CCFAP rules, policies, um, and procedures and plans, child care provider credentialing and compensation standards, early childhood care and education curricula standards, including anti-racist early childhood education practices and standards, and the early care and education governance and administration study um, that we already looked at in section 12. And then we go on to look at the members. Um, of this advisory committee. They're all appointed by Building Bright Futures and it's composed of the following members. A parent or caregiver from a large town or city, a parent or caregiver from a rural community, a family child care home provider, a center-based child care and preschool um, program provider, 
a Head Start Family Policy Advisory Council member, a Head Start Early Childhood Provider or Program Director, a representative of the Vermont Association for the Education of Young Children, a representative of the Vermont Early Childhood Education Higher Education Consortium, a representative of the Parent Child Center Network, a representative of a community child care resource agency, a provider of children's integrated services, a provider of childhood special education services, a regional universal pre-K coordinator, a, pre a pediatrician, and a community member. The committee is to have the administrative assistance of Building Bright Futures and the technical and legal assistance of the Child Development Division. There is a report required annually on or before January 15th. A written report is due to this committee and Senate Health and Welfare with a summary of its annual activities, findings, and recommendations for legislative action. Uh, in terms of meetings, Building Bright Futures is to call the first meeting by September 1st of this year. The committee would select a chair from among its members. The majority makes up a quorum and the committee would cease to exist on January 1, 2024. Then we have um, compensation and reimbursement for not more than six meetings annually. <laughs> and in fiscal year 2022, that um, appropriation is 25,000 for the year appropriated to building bright futures. And again, we have the same definition of early care and education that we've seen in the previous two sections. And we've made it to the end, the effective date section. Um, the bill takes effect July 1, 2021, with the exception of that duplicate um, section in the subsidy program that we looked at, um, which takes effect July 1, 2022. And that is it. Okay, I'll um, entertain a, a, a motion to um, <laughs> approve this bill. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, this is the beginning of our um, exploration um, of this, and uh, it really is a walkthrough um, of it. Um, Representative uh, Rosenquist. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make sure I understand. The, the changes that are made are changes to what? Was there an underlying bill or is this a bill from last year? Maybe I didn't understand that. Uh, but, you know, you showed a lot of changes to different things here. What are we changing? So this was a new bill that was introduced in this biennium. Some of the changes, particularly the changes in the first half of the bill, are changes made to existing law, like um, the subsidy program. So those are already in the green books, they're existing law that have um, been in, you know, been law for a number of years. They've been amended over the years. Some of the latter language, the language that is all um, underlined, um, particularly the different study groups, um, the financing group, the advisory committee, that's all um, proposed. That's all a proposal, new law. That isn't amending anything. And the same is true of the workforce supports. That's a proposal for, for new law. It's not amending anything. Thank you. That, that helps me put it in perspective. Thank you. We've got um, at this juncture, um, a couple of minutes for questions of content <coughs> um, to, uh, to Katie. Topper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I have uh, one question. Um, on page 15, line 11, and on page 20, line 21, a term is used there and, it, and the term is anti-racist. Do we have a definition of either racist or anti-racist? I, co I couldn't find one in the bill. There's not a definition in the bill of either racist or anti-racist. Is there a definition someplace in the existing law? 
I don't have an answer to that. I would have to look and um, get back to you. Okay, thank you. Jessica. Thanks. Um, something I didn't think of, um, Katie, when we were originally working on this was part-time. Do we have a definition of what equals part-time? Like it's not just five hours or? We don't have anything specific in the bill, but I'm guessing if I were to consult with um, Damian Leonard, who deals with labor law, that he might be able to direct us to the right place in statute um, and it could be that we could add a cross-reference in, um, depending if the committee liked that definition or if you wanted to kind of come up with your own. Um, but I can reach out to him and I'll, I'll ask that question. Great, thank you. Are we at the after lunch lull? <laughs> um, just so folks um, know, this is A, the beginning. I mean, I thought, you know, it's clearly it's important that we know, have a walkthrough of what the language is. Um, and uh, there are, this is a um, piece of legislation that um, I want to say the overall concept of the importance of childcare is very important to 90 some odd, if not more, members of the House and Senate. That doesn't, I mean, of the House. That does not mean that 90 members agree with all the aspects of the 23 pages. And um, so that is part and parcel of what we will need to be doing is hearing, um, not necessarily from representatives, but from um, the stakeholders and from people who will be impacted. Um, in terms of House Human Services, we'll, we will be starting tomorrow, as you see on the agenda, hearing from what I would say um, three of the um, major, three of the provider or advocacy organizations that have been, that will be either um, impacted by the language of this or, and have some views. One of which is clearly Let's Grow Kids, who um, helped set the framework for some of this. Clearly, clearly it is our Department of Children and Families because there are, there's language in here that is, um, assumes a certain direction that may or may not be consistent with the direction of the administration. So um, um, a couple of you um, have wondered how and when we might be looking at um, the governor's um, proposal. Um, this is one place because there are things in here that may not be consistent with what the governor is um, uh, proposing. And so we're going to begin with that. And then there are there is a significant role for building bright futures um, in this bill. And so we want to hear from them. Um, that, you know, then I think it's important that we all figure out what, how, how, who else we need, who do we need to hear from, what are um, um, providers or groups or individuals who we may never, who we may not usually hear from, that it is important that we hear from um, in terms of uh, childcare. Um, and then to know that um, this bill has a long way to go, or shall I say has lots of stops before it gets to the floor. Um, most likely education. Um, and if you look at some by, um, by the appropriation of money, it will have to go to um, by, by house rules. It will have to go to appropriations. And um, in terms of some of the aspects of the study, it very well may need to formally go to um, ways and means. Um, and then there is whether or not it formally or informally goes to um, commerce and economic development um, in terms of, of that. At this point, those are the committees that have been identified as 
potential interests as a committee, not as individuals, um, in terms of, shall I say, um, policy interests, whether or not all will take, um, whether, whether some will just, will, will take possession or whether, um, um, for ins or whether they will just do a look-see is another question. Um, crossover has not been um, identified yet, um, but when that is identified, we're gonna need to be doing um, some backward planning. Um, and given, given the path that this bill needs to go, um, we'll need to focus um, a lot on this bill in the coming weeks after we do the budget. Um, so I know that um, um, we would, that um, in terms of setting the agenda and thinking about who we want to hear from, um, I don't know if right now you have some ideas off the top of your head, um, but keep that in mind in terms of what are the perspectives and voices that will be important to hear. Um, and um, while, while Katie has, I think, other places to go um, this afternoon, it will not be the last time that she is available to us for um, questions about content or what things mean um, and how to make sense of some of the, the language. Um, Before we take um, a 15 minute um, break, um, because we're gonna go on to some other things as well. Um, are there some quick questions for Katie in terms of content? You know, Topper wants to know if there are places anywhere um, definition of, um, what, of racism and Jessica asked about what does part-time mean? Okay, Katie, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we will see you, I'm sure, very soon. <laughs> um, and uh, committee, um, let's take a, um, be back my clock says it's 2.02. .02, and um, how about we take, um, come back by 2.15. So a 13 minute break. Um, and when we come back, we're gonna um, do the big reveal on um, what the committee priorities were in terms of um, the voting and expectations. And then after that, we'll be having um, uh, a presentation and information from um, uh, Jen around advanced directives and, and some neat, some requested changes as it rel relates to COVID-19 needs. Um, so let's take a break. And I, as we are taking a break, we will be, um, I believe, still on YouTube. So please um, keep your, your voice off and turn off your picture and I'll see you now in 12 minutes. <clears throat> Thank you. 